The Carboniferous period is usually well known for the invasion and diversification of land tetrapods. The giant arthropods which flourished in the oxygen-rich atmosphere, or even the extensive plant life which created enormous deposits of energy-rich coal. But little attention is often paid to the inhabitants of this sea. Besides the now famous buzzsaw shark Helicoprion, many other bizarre water dwellers patrolled the seas over the course of this period of time. One such critter was the sword-faced buzzsaw shark Ornithoprion. The Chicago Field Museum has been around for about 130 years. In that time, many fossil invertebrate curators have come and gone. One of the most accomplished was Eugene Richardson. He was responsible for the creation of one of the most comprehensive fossil invertebrate museum exhibits of the early 1950s, with the collection of 1,300 fossils and 53 cases to house and interpret them for the many tens of thousands of visitors the museum saw and still enjoys to this day. His subsequent project that he co-ran with curator of fossil fish Rainer Zangirl was the detailed paleoecological study of a bunch of shale from East Indiana. This shale came from an ancient Pennsylvanian-aged seabed that had been preserved in rock layers across Illinois and Indiana. The two paleontologists and their crew specifically quarried fossils from the Mecca Quarry Shale member of the Linton Formation and the Logan Quarry Shale member of the Staunton Formation in Park County, Indiana. When all was said and done, the team had collected 180 square feet of ancient ocean floor and transported it all to the museum intact and reconstructed all of that shale into a flat sheet so they could more easily interpret and describe all fossil remains preserved in the layer. To do this, they did minor fossil preparation but then shot x-rays through the whole thing. This was due to the fragile nature of the rock which had squashed all fossil remains within it to two dimensions. Once they had prepared the specimens and x-rayed everything they could out of it all, Zangirl and Richardson published a massive 352-page treatise on everything they had found, making it one of the most comprehensive and classic studies on the paleoecology of the Pennsylvanian oceans. This massive endeavor revealed how an entire ancient ecosystem worked, as well as many previously unknown animals. Among these were nine fish fossils, most of which had to be x-rayed due to their friable nature. One of these specimens, taken from the Logan Quarry layer, was excavated manually and split down the middle. Shale is incredibly fine-grained sedimentary rock made out of super-eroded, super-weathered particles of quartz and calcite and the like. Once this is laid down on a surface, it becomes a rock over millions of years. Because of the amount of carbon and the size of the particles which usually get mixed in with this type of rock, it becomes super thin and laminated. Laminated just means it has a ton of super thin layers. Fossils preserved in this type of rock often get fossilized in two dimensions, either on their side or belly. The fossil fish from Indiana were only visible from the outcrop as blobs of shale, since the fossils themselves were encased in the rock. Since the rock was a super hard, chemically resistant carbonaceous shale, the crew had to get creative with how to actually see what they were working with. The one split fossil gave a good starting point on what exactly might be in the blobs and how to get a better look without breaking them. The fossils which stuck to either slab preserved extremely small details down to the micron scale that would be nearly impossible for a fossil preparator to manually prepare without damage especially in the 1960s when this discovery occurred. I wonder with how good our tech is now, maybe we could do this with the help of a big microscope. So what did they use to see the preserved soft tissues, cartilage, scales, and bones? X-ray radiography. Since CT scanning tech didn't exist or exist in the same way as it does today, X-rays were the only option. What the researchers found once they X-rayed the specimens was quite unusual. The bones preserved were mostly skulls of a type of cartilaginous fish of the holocephali subclass. These fish aren't technically sharks, but close relatives in the same way as stingrays and mantas. 
I've included this critter in Shark Week because its relative Helicoprion is often called a shark and probably looked a little like a shark, so I thought it'd fit in too. Since x-rays aren't usually used for seeing into fossils, and since they aren't great and had bad resolution at the time, the images produced of what rested within the shale blobs are of poor quality. That being said, they were still useful in giving a general idea of what the bones look like. And from there, diagrams could be estimated of what's going on within the stone. Most of the specimens preserved skulls. Most of the specimens also preserved evidence of feeding traces. Each specimen had some kind of mangling going on prior to fossilization, with many decapitated from their bodies. The severed pieces of the sharks settled to the bottom and were quickly covered in a fine sediment. Aerobic decomposition was followed by anaerobic decomposition, enough to deflesh most of the bones but not enough to destroy the cartilage. Many of the cartilage elements have decayed away though, leaving spaces between the calcified bone where they once were. One specimen did preserve some of the skeleton, and another a nearly intact skull. Together, the fossils present a shark-like fish with a long pointed skull. The lower jaw was much longer than the upper, and embedded in the middle was a whorl of teeth. The buzzsaw mechanism characteristic of this group of fish. The upper jaw had some low-crowned bar teeth, which look like brass knuckles or molars of some kind. The rest of the upper jaw apparently also had some kind of tooth whorl, but the text on that was a little confusing. The lower jaw also has shock-resistant bony reinforcements at the back end where it attached to the skull. The critter was named Ornithoprion hertwigi, translating to Hertwig's bird saw, because the eye sockets were so large they made the skull almost look like a bird's skull. I get where the descriptors were coming from, but I don't think bird saw should have been wasted on a fish. The entire body is not known, but a good portion of the front half is. They probably had about five pairs of gill arches, a long body, and strong front fins. Paleo artists like Ray Troll, Joshua Kanupa, and Julius Chotany initially reconstructed the beast with a body more like a frill shark or a goblin shark. However, later paleo artists would recontextualize the body shape of this critter thanks to the better preserved remains of close relatives. These things may have been a bit more generically shark shaped. Speaking of which, what even is Ornithoprion? Back in the 1950s and 60s, the field of phylogenetics, or how everything is related to everything, wasn't as complex as it is today. They were using old taxonomic and morphologic techniques because that was all they had. As such, I cannot use my tried and true when they tallied up all the traits in the phylogenetic software of their choice line. They still observed, described, and recorded all of the animal's traits and tried to place it in an evolutionary context, but they didn't have all the fossil samples that exist now and didn't have software to help out. Nor were they working with DNA and stuff like that. So, according to Rainer Zangirl, the guy who published the paper on Ornithoprion specifically, it's a member of the Eugeniodontida order, which also belongs to that holocephali group I mentioned earlier. The holocephali used to be much more common, with members converging on the shark body and ecology, like Stethacanthus and Falcatus, while others took on adaptations which made them look more like a sci-fi concept for a living spaceship. Yet more adapted for reefs and tropical waters of the Carboniferous and Permian periods, with bizarre crinkle-cut french fry-shaped bodies with all the frills and trimmings, like this fine fella Balancey. The group which Ornithoprion belonged to was a lot closer in shape and sometimes ecology to the only living group, the ratfishes. What it used its super long mouth sword for is the big unknown. It could have used it like the modern swordfish and stabbed its prey with it, or it could have trawled along the ocean bottom to stir up any tasty treats. As bizarre as Ornithoprion seems, it was not the first nor the last. The first giant underbite carrying freak of nature was the Placoderm alienacanthus. Alienacanthus was a placoderm fish from the Devonian period. It was weird in having teeth in its giant lower jaw that continued past the tip of the upper jaw. There were also the ray finned Sorodon and Sorocephalus of the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. After Ornithoprion came the less extreme Pliocene porpoise Semirostrum that used its supersensitive chin to grub for critters in the dirt. 
Aside from them, there is also the relatively long-lived family Hemiramphidae, a bunch of ray-finned fish called half-beaks. They appeared in the Paleogene and are still around today. They are perhaps a bit more similar to Alien Acanthus in having a short upper jaw compared to the giant lower jaw. What these other fish use their sword jaws for is also kind of mysterious. The sword jaws of the Cretaceous fish are much shorter than our Ornithoprion buddy and perhaps even more reinforced, enough to make some researchers think they used it for ramming and fighting. I don't think we could say the same for the Alien Acanthus or Ornithoprion sword. Bottom feeding can be ruled out for the bird saw, because bottom feeders usually have their mouths situated on the bottom of their heads, facing the seafloor. The teeth of Ornithoprion are the type usually used for crushing hard prey, like shelled mollusks and armored arthropods, so the sediment-stirring face sword makes the most sense so far. A reverse condition of over-large upper jaws and tiny lower jaws also appear in the fossil record, like in the ichthyosaurs Excalibosaurus and Urinosaurus. But I'll pack it in because we're getting carried away. But despite the seemingly giant jaws of Ornithoprion, these things weren't enormous spear-jawed chads. Let's bring it. Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme. To get a visual representation of the true size of the bird saw. Despite the bizarre anatomy and seemingly ferocious appearance, these critters were pipsqueaks. The skulls measured around 4 inches, or 10 centimeters. That would mean the rest of the body would probably be pretty small too. Not much more than a meter, 3 feet. Though I wouldn't be surprised if the body was actually smaller. Thanks, Mr. Man. That's pretty much all there is to know about Ornithoprion at this time. These specimens presumably still exist locked away in storage. Since the paper which described them was published in the Field Museum's journal, I bet the Ornithoprion fossils still reside there. Someone ought to get on CT scanning these fossils since I bet a lot more detail could be observed now that there is better tech. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.